I'm going to record a copy on my end too, just in case. That's, that sounds great. Well, you know what, we, we will get underway and people can join us as they um, as they come from that last session. I'm going to begin recording. Lovely. So I'm uh, Lynn Kostelniak and I am the secretary of USITT Upstate Section and um, we are so pleased to be joined by Matt Reynolds today. Um, I'm going to let Matt introduce himself and then I'll just explain some of the functionality of uh, today's session. Hello everybody, I'm Matt Reynolds, uh, Assistant Professor of Lighting, Sound, and Digital Design at the University of Alabama. Uh, today we'll be talking about design process and workflow for projection design, um, which translates pretty easily into digital media design of other kinds like online production, video, etc. So if you have a question for Matt, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A and I will be following along to make sure that those get answered. You can give questions a thumbs up if you two are thinking that and are really wanting to hear that answer. And if you want to talk amongst yourself, feel free to use the chat. So I see we're up to 12 participants, which is great. And I am going to turn the floor over to Matt to begin his presentation. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to start sharing my screen. I don't need to share my computer sound though. All right, hello. Oh, and hi, Tatiana. Good to see you, Tatiana. Well, not see you because I can't see you, but you can see me. All right. So, projection design, uh, process and workflow. I'm gonna keep talking until somebody stops me. So Lynn is gonna step in and interrupt me uh, as we go with questions and, and thoughts and comments. Um, but we're just gonna talk through what the general process is and useful vocabulary, useful tips, um, as we're going through with a uh, projection process. Um, first and foremost is of course to plan. Like any other design area, um, we need to set a schedule of when we expect our deadlines to be, when we expect our assets to be done, when we expect to be in the space. Um, tech is, is always a good marker to count backwards from the first tech. Um, but keep revisiting that schedule again and again and again and again you will find that oh the director says oh this one thing looks great can you do that for the rest of the show uh yeah <laughs> but we have to do a whole lot more filming to get enough content to do that um so if the schedule needs to be revisited revisit it um but be be aware and keep uh, aware of that um yeah it sucks being the person who's behind say yeah yeah sorry you know this design area is, is behind right now because we're we were aiming for this target um but it's better to be come out with it and say hey we're running behind than to pretend everything's fine and then everything comes crashing to a halt at tech um know the venue all right with projections particularly you've got to have a pretty decent idea of where you're going to stick your projectors, where your surfaces are. Um, so as familiar as you can get with the space as possible is ideal. Uh, this includes uh, uh, photos of the space. Sometimes we just get plans or ground plans, which don't tell us that, oh, by the way, this whole wall is a bright red. Well, maybe we don't want to project on that because that's going to skew all of our colors to a red area. Um, so photos really help. Photos of previous shows there can really help, especially if um, the company you're producing for uh, has a habit of producing them in a specific way or with the audience in a specific orientation. Um, if you have 3D models, grid plans, line set plans, ground plans, section drawings, the usual, um, any kind of diagrams of power, data, lighting, sound systems, because if you need to tie into those systems, if they have a, a Cat5 data system that's just sitting there doing nothing and you can use that for projection then great um, but knowing where those things are can be important knowing whether or not you have power on the deck knowing whether or not you have power where you want to put your projector and where you got to get it from um, you can't uh, design the projection without knowing what your audience's viewing angles are going to be you really need to know what your audience is going to be in relation to um, to your projection so um, getting in the space nothing um, gets you closer than sitting in the space, moving around the space, being where the audience is, um, and getting those viewing angles. Um, 
if you can get to the projection position uh, views, that would be great too. Or just if you can get up to those positions, if it's like the front of a balcony, take some shots, take some photos, even if it's on your iPhone or whatnot, take some shots so you can think, okay, if my surface is over here, it's gonna be skewed like this. So that's what I can hit from this angle. Or, oh, there's a giant column in the way. These are useful things to know. Um, and any booth infrastructure, play, um, if you need to know that, oh, my projection op can't see the target from this position, maybe we've got to get them a uh, position outside the booth. Maybe they can be over in the middle of house sound position or in the balcony or in the catwalks. Um, that's always something to keep in mind. Design meetings, just like with every other design area, hopefully these happen early and regularly throughout the process. Um, Sometimes you have to video conference, as we are doing now, or um, a conference call in, and that's okay. That's actually normal um, in the professional design world. Yeah, it feels awkward, especially if you're the only one who is videoing in, in and everybody else is just physically there. Um, it can feel um, rather out of place, but this is, I promise you, a very common um, thing, especially now. Um, so using a video conference application like GoToMeeting or Skype or Zoom is, is very helpful for those kinds of meetings. Um, always ask nicely if you're going to have production meetings and you're remoting in for things that you might need from the other end, such as a dedicated mic, a dedicated speaker, wide angle lens camera, so you can see everybody who's at the, at the table, the conference table. Um, a dedicated computer so that somebody who isn't isn't trying to switch back and forth between what they're presenting and being able to see you and you presenting and all that and having a backup plan um, even if it's just all right i'll call in on my cell phone with on speaker phone and just talk um, have a backup plan and on your end use headphones <laughs> with a mic um, separate a uh, separate device for taking notes um, because you don't want to switch between your screens while you're taking your notes um, use an office. Don't go to Starbucks. Don't go to a cafe. You, you don't want all that excess noise um, like I'm getting from my cat who's scratching the door to try and be let in right now. Um, and always test your internet connection. Um, I like to use speedtest.net to make sure that I've got a solid connection. It tells me what my upload and download speeds. Anybody can do it. Just go to speedtest.net and you can see what your upload and download speeds are. Um, at such design meetings, take copious notes. I write down all the keywords that my, my director says, all the keywords that my other designers are jumping on. They say things like, oh, it, tree, water, horizon. Then these are words that I wanna call on and I wanna be able to reuse later. So I make sure that I'm designing with the other designers. I wanna make sure that we're playing in the same sandbox. Um, so they're throwing out certain ideas about, oh, it, this is about sibling rivalry, or this is about how death is not normalized in our culture, or this is about how um, uh, there's uh, a ship and, and a mast and, and all these things. If there are certain themes that uh, people are drawing on, draw them together, all right? Uh, it's the best way to, st to stay on task and, and to stay in the same world is listen to each other, listen to the director, what things the director is ham hammering home, the messages, etc. Um, and listening to your other designers because we are all designing for the same show. So we have to play nice. Limits. Now, as, as much as we would all love a multi-billion dollar budget and all the, all the equipment in the world and all the people and labor in the world and all the time in the world, we will never have that. Um, so setting realistic limits for your director and the rest of the design team is, is very important. And if you need to revisit those limits, then do so. Um, but revisit uh, how much content you can make when it's due, when you're expecting things to be done. Um, if you're generating renderings for backgrounds throughout the process, you can say, all right, my first pass are going to be due at these dates. My second pass are going to be due at these dates. And we should have our finalized renderings um, these days before tech. Um, or whatever Matt, if I can just jump be. in. Could you yes, see Lynn. you have a search window open at the bottom of your presentation? It might be blocking some things on the slides. I can fix that. Thank you. Doop -doop -doo. How's that? Nope. Can I get a thumbs up from somebody? Has it looked okay? Perfect. Thank you. Lovely. All right. 
Uh, negotiating deliverables. Um, so set clear expectations of when what is expected, when you expect things to be done. Um, because if, like most situations, you're the only digital media designer, the only projection designer there, and you don't have a team of graphic designers at yet your disposal, you need to set realistic limits. Um, don't hide what you don't know. If, if you If you don't if you're not sure how to do something, for instance, I did a show a while back that they said, oh, can we um, do this green screen thing with um, this set, but we don't have green screen. Can we just use the black stage as our green screen service? And in my head, I was thinking, there is a way to do that. I just haven't done it in this context. So yes, but I'm just not sure how yet. Um, be open with that kind of stuff. If you know that, yes, there is a way to do this thing, you just don't know how yet, that's fine, just be clear about that. Um, assets, assets are a term that we uh, typically use in digital media design to um, describe individual content-based elements. Photo, still photos, videos, illustrations, text bars, um, any of that stuff, any kind of things, any kind of content that we're putting in, we call assets. We can also use it to refer to specific effects that we're applying as well. Um, oh, it's this snow effect, this, this um, TV snow effect, or it's this rain effect that's an asset that we can apply on top of things. Advocate for a realistic budget as soon as possible. And um, if you're like me, that budget is almost always zero. Um, and, you'll, and you'll find that, oh, right, your budget is, is let's do as, as good as you can with as little as you can, and we'll, we'll make adjustments as necessary. I've had um, artistic directors, uh, producing managers say, you can have as much as you need, but use as little as you can. Um, so get an idea of what that range is, so you know whether or not you need to buy a projector, if you need to rent a projector, if you need to, uh, if you have enough money to pay someone to generate content, if you, um, need to rent separate lenses and uh, the playback station and all that fun stuff. Um, so figure out what is your range of stuff that you can play with. Um, a lot of theater companies have their own gear um, now that they acquire bit by bit by bit. Um, like, oh, we have a QLab station that has video playback, but we don't have a, a video card that, that really supports it very well. Okay, well maybe we can get a video card. Um, those kinds of things. Um, now with whoop, production meetings, our design meetings are uh, geared towards developing our artistic intent, um, figuring out the goals, the messages, the themes and motifs. And our production meetings are figuring out the nitty gritty of when things are happening, what our deadlines are, how we're folding in with marketing and negotiating who gets the stage at what times, when we can focus, when we can um, test things, when we have Q to Q and all those things. Um, for research, read the script again and again and again, as many times as it takes for, for it to sink in. Um, the first time, uh, read it for pleasure, just to understand it, um, to get a feeling of the show, the story. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes we're dealing with uh, devised scripts or, or sort of an outline of what the show is um, without a specific line by line um, dialogue, um, in which case just keep taking notes and keep evolving as the script evolves or as the outline of the device piece evolves. Note your stage directions, but as we've all learned probably, um, the stage directions that appear in a script are not necessarily something we can execute in production. Uh, I had a uh, playwright once wrote, right, um, oh, Christmas present appears and a giant feast magically appears like a million tiny mirrors reflecting all over the stage. And he knew we did not have the budget for something like that. <laughs> so um, note the stage directions, do the best you can, um, but manage those expectations both for you and the rest of the design team. Um, note your scene changes, your blocking, blackouts, any kind of beats that happen in the, in the play, but be flexible. Um, both in your ideas of, oh, this scene can just flow right into the next scene, great, that saves us a transition and we don't have to build content for that transition now. Um, but, oh, we wanna pause here for this monologue and we wanna silhouette that with some background virtual sonography. Okay, great, then let's work on that. Um, 
take notes in whatever uh, format works for you, um, whether it's physically writing, writing it down on pencil and paper or keeping it in a computer using um, note cards or mind mapping software, um, whatever works for you. Um, for me, I like using spreadsheets uh, to keep uh, a lot of notes. Um, as with any design area, we break down the show into an action chart or, or a scene by scene breakdown to say, okay, here are entrances and exits. Here's uh, the scene changes. Here is the important information that we need to know about when and where the scene is, what season is it, what time of day is it. Um, and this becomes the framework, the, the background for what will eventually be your cue list, your list of every visual element that uh, digital media provides for that production. Um, for each scene, it's important to identify who the characters are, whether they're present or not, even if they're just referred to or mentioned. Um, uh, the plot points, where are we in the plot? What is this scene contributing to the overall arc of the dynamic of the show, the overall arc of the show? Where we are, both physically and emotionally, um, mentally, metaphysically. Uh, time of day, season, and um, how we're moving through time. Are we in doing a moment by moment verisimilitude where it's you know we're like the tv show 24 that every moment that happens on stage is a moment in reality um or are there flashbacks and jump forwards do we have slow motion moments do we have wistful memory nostalgia moments um how are we moving through time um any historical periods if we're in a particular historical period uh, if there's anything special about that scene, special effects, heightened reality, Hamlet's dad shows up and, you know, the ghost and gets all angry, you know, what, if there's anything special going on in that scene that we need to support, take note of it. Uh, there are objects and prompts uh, that uh, we need to include in our research. Um, if there's a prop that's supposed to be handed through the projection to a ghost or something like that, um, that's an important thing to note so that when we do our filming that they have the same prop. Um, if there's hidden moments that we want to underscore, like, oh, they mentioned this little thing that's subtext that's referring to a later thing that's going to happen, it's important that we note that. Um, and any kind of updates that we're doing to the show. Um, for instance, I was um, working with a production company that once did a version of the Who's Tommy, um, but they up updated the, the pinball wizard uh, world to a Wii game um, using the Wiimotes. Um, this was 10 years ago. Um, had some copyright issues with that one. But um, keep in mind, as you're going through each scene, how are you adapting it? What is the scene doing for you? And what are you doing for the scene? Uh, the same examination has to be done constantly for devised works because those are constantly evolving. So where it is in its uh, ev evolution in, in the production will change. Where it fits in the plot line, where it fits in the dynamic will change. Um, so if you have an outline or score instead of a script, use that as your baseline so that you can understand, all right, this is changing here, that's going to change there, and we've got to shift our cues around. Uh, in the device process, um, if there's a primary source or idea, stick to it. Keep Make sure that you're always going back to that idea um, and set clear goals. In a device process, often the digital media designer is in the rehearsal room with um, uh, the rest of the cast and creating and imagining and developing as we go, um, which um, you don't want to be in the position of being handled the hot potato of, oh yeah, digital media can handle that. We can, we can make it magically appear in um, the netherworld that is inverted imagery everywhere. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about that. <laughs> let's let's make, make sure that we're doing that on purpose, that we have a reason for it, what our digital media is saying in that moment and how it's supporting the story. Because we always, always, always want to go back to telling the story. Don't hide your ideas, but don't cling to them either. Um, get them out in the open. Don't be afraid to change them. Don't be afraid to change tack on dime. Once an idea is out of your head and out in the, in the ether for the rest of the team, it can get torn up, stomped on, ripped to shreds. It's fine. It's not you getting torn up, ripped on, and torn to shreds. It's just the idea, and the idea belongs to everyone once it's out of your head. Um, 
work it into the process, uh, particularly for, for designed, uh, sorry, devised pieces. It's important that you make sure that you're participating in the process. Don't just expect digital media to appear at the last moment and, oh, now we're going to reblock the show so that you're interacting with this digital media person. No. Um, if you're going to do that, then start folding it in, even if it's in very rough shod ideas of a virtual character or something like that. Um, integrate it as soon as you can, as much as you can, and clean up as you go. Um, research. For, for your research, you can go down the proverbial um, Google wormhole, uh, but keep making sure you're checking back with that primary idea, that primary message. Um, you don't want to get too far off your primary path. Um, libraries are great for this. I love going to the library to do, to do my research. You know, I'm just pulling out books to find things about the time period, place, people, um, any ideas, artists, uh, styles, um, and always in the library I like because it's, uh, you know, you've got a whole section of a shelf that happens to be about that same subject. It can be a, a lot of fun to explore those things and, and find those um, surprises. Take advantage of the dramaturg's work. If there is a dramaturg on the production saying, hey, we're setting this in 1954, not 1955, so we, we need to make sure that this doesn't happen and this is not there because there's a reference to this line at this point. And, if, if the dramaturg is providing you with data, providing you with imagery and thoughts and background of stuff, then yeah, use that. Um, but don't uh, expect them to do all your work for you. You gotta do your own studies as well. For previous productions, um, a lot of companies have figured out an elegant solution for certain issues. They know that, oh, well, we know in this space that this is the only place that we can really put our projectors because there's audience over here and there's a column over there and this is just where it has to be. Um, that's fine. Use that knowledge. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, but don't be afraid to explore. Don't be afraid to demo, to try things out um, and see if you can find other solutions. Um, it's just, it's six to one, half does the other, you know, you want to be aware of what has worked in the past without letting it contaminate your process or force you into a box you don't want to be in. Um, you can organize your research as uh, in any way that works well for you. Um, you can organize it by style or genre or period. You can organize it with a mood board of, of how you like your moods through, to evolve throughout the show or a color board. Um, if you want to group things by their shapes or forms or textures, if you want to group things by how they move in the play or the pacing of the show, the tempo, where it is in the show and how your research folds into that tempo to support that moment, then you can do that. Sharing your research. Um, to prevent copyright infringement, you should spreadsheet all of your image finds. So if you're pulling imagery from Google or, you know, um, from any kind of Pixabay, Pexels, uh, any kind of online um, source, it's important that you keep a spreadsheet of where you found all those things. Um, reverse Google image search can help sometimes, um, but won't always get you back to the original image and who owns the original publishing rights to that particular image. Um, it can only take you so far. So wherever you find your stuff, just put off to the side, either save a little thumbnail of it or in, an, in the description of the file name or put in a Google spreadsheet separately, describe the image and write where you found it and um, any information about its publishing rights that you can find. Just because you Google copyright free images and hit enter does not mean everything that comes up is going to be copyright free. Um, for sharing your research, um, slideshows work great, obviously. Um, Pinterest boards uh, are, are very popular now. Um, if you have an organized online folder, uh, a lot of folks use Box or Dropbox. Uh, or if you want to just make mood boards and make either physical or virtual mood boards to say this is this moment feels dry and crackly and, and delicate, uh, but also beautiful, um, then you can do that and create that. Put together some sort of conceptual design statement that's driving your design. Um, so this goes back to that those earlier concept discussions um, with the director and the design team. If they're tossing out words like tree, forest, water, river, um, then and you want to reinforce those ideas, then use those and um, consolidate them into your design statements. Um, doesn't mean you have to have one specific 
pre uh, premise that says this show is blank leads to blank. It doesn't, you don't necessarily have to have that, but um, having uh, a key idea in your head, some keystone that you could keep going back to of what is the message I'm telling with digital media? What is the role of digital media in this show um, is kind of important. Be sure you're on the same page with, as a director, um, preferably before you present it to the others. Um, uh, you don't want to force, similarly, you don't want to force the director into a tiny box that they don't want to be into. Um, so making sure that you're talking about the same things and on the same page is very uh, useful and important. Um, we don't always have the time to give our presentation to the director individually and then do it for the rest of the design team or the cast. Um, that's not a luxury we always have, um, but make sure that you're at least in the conversation and that the things you're talking about are in the same world, that you're not surprising um, the director um, with any big uh, hurrahs that, <laughs> that they're not seeing coming. Take notes when you are sharing your research, um, listen to feedback um, and adjust. Um, and it's important you take those notes because while you're in the midst of giving a presentation or saying, all right, this is my research and I'm doing all this and that and the other, if people are mentioning, but how does that relate to this? How does that relate to that? Then you need to take note of that so you make sure that you're staying on the same page. It's easy to get lost in your own presentation. Um, so make changes, not excuses. If your design doesn't fit with everybody else's, if it doesn't fit with the production of the show, then make changes to make it fit, all right? Um, if you're not fitting in the style or the period or just the general feeling or the mood or your idea of the climax is over here and their idea of the climax is over there, get on the same page. Um, whether it's compromising and finding a middle ground or picking one or the other, it's all about supporting the show and telling the story. Um, so make those changes. Don't be afraid to make those changes. Now, cue lists. When we break down our, um, our ideas, our visual ideas of projection and digital media, whether it's for to be put on televisions or um, projected onto an actor or onto a site or a movie screen, we break down all those visual ideas into cue lists. And our cue list can be as detailed uh, as, as possible. Um, uh, columns for my cue lists change by the show. Um, sometimes we have act and scene, or sometimes even line numbers uh, to show where it's triggered, what's triggering this idea. Uh, and it's some sort of cue identification, whether it's a number, a letter, a color, any kind of way. This is cue red, this is cue A, this is cue double A, et cetera. Um, have some designation for those. Um, and don't be afraid to talk to your um, stage manager about what they want to call their video cues. Um, if they want to call uh, video A, or they want to use letters, and they want you to use letters and then double letters and then triple letters, then fine. Um, I try to uh, adapt those as much as I can to make it more convenient for the stage manager, because they're the ones who have to fit all that uh, stuff in their mouth and, and spit it all back out. I prefer sticking with numbers because, hey, numbers, they make sense. Um, but if, that, if stage manager wants letters, if they want colors, if they want some other magical thing, unicorns, then provide them with, with what they need. Um, all right, uh, not seeing any questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, how are we doing, Lynn? Very, so no, no questions at this time. And all right. right at the halfway mark. Lovely, lovely. Okay, well, don't be afraid to ask questions. If you've got a show that you're working on, you're like, hey, how do I do this thing? Ask. Um, uh, other things we can include on the, on the queue list, obviously page numbers so that we can make sure that we're on the same literal page as the rest of the design team, is we're making sure you have the right copy, <laughs> the right version of the script matters. Um, because if that script keeps getting updated, lines keep getting cut, or um, things of that nature, it's important that you have the right version and you keep that updated as well. Um, if you have auto follows built in, that means you have one visual cue that's triggering another thing that's triggering another thing. If it's connected to audio in some way, if you have lights, video, or sound all triggering each other, which one is triggering which? Is the light cue triggering the video cue? Is triggering the sound cue? Or is it just video and audio is folded into the sound, into the, uh, the video cue? Um, or is it just going to have to be synchronized between two go buttons? How you want to do that? Um, take note of all those little details. Um, a very detailed cue description. 
this is where we can can get really artsy in our in our cue lists just write it as flowery as you can write it this is an explosion of merriment uh, of bright yellows and golds and and greens that that fills our audience with joy as scrooge discovers he has a heart after all um if you if you want to get flowery get flowery this is where you can do it um Whatever's triggering what, whatever is saying, all right, this is what's causing this event to happen, whether it's a line, a moment, an action, uh, some other cue with lights, whatever it is. And you can note a whole bunch of other things such as dramatic action, where we are in the, in the drama, what the time of day is, time of season, um, and process elements such as, all right, what's our priority from completing this? Is this gonna be easy to complete? Is it gonna be tough to complete? Who has to complete it? When is it done? Is it done? What version is it? What file name is it? I keep all those little notes off to the side of like, this is uh, uh, map root beige uh, underscore this date uh, seven or whatever it is. Um, so you know which one you're going for. Um, uh, I like online spreadsheets. If you have a team of people working on these things, um, uh, usually I don't find that the um, rest of the designers really care um, what my cue list is looking like. The stage manager obviously does. But if you've got assistant designers or you've got um, content creators who are working on this, having an online spreadsheet can really help. Something like Google Sheets, um, because then you're all working on the same literal document. I use this very well for um, copyright. Um, so when I have um, uh, an assistant designer who I say, here, I want these images, I want these sounds, go find the copyright information for this having an online spreadsheet where we can say, all right, found it here, here's a reference, here's the BMI catalog number, et cetera. And here's our proof that we have access to it and that we paid for this, et cetera. Um, so these cues eventually become your punch list, your to-do list, and you can organize it by your, what is the priority of completion or whose job is it to complete this thing, this to create this content and so on. Do, 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 do. see we have something in the chat you're very thorough i really appreciate it you're welcome absolutely i just hope i'm not diving too deep into stuff that you already know and is a waste of your time i don't want to waste anybody's time all right after cue uh more cue lists so as i said in cues uh depending on what your playback system um can be labeled anything um QLab, for instance, very common um, tool for playing back video in a theater setting. Um, it's a linear um, progression, so it makes sense um, to a lot of folks who think in a linear uh, path. In QLab, for instance, you can name your, your cues, whatever you want. Numbers, letters, colors, give them titles, whatever. Uh, but having some sort of orderly system helps. Um, I already talked to you about the SM having any cue IDing present, uh, preferences. I like to number my cues ideally and numbering them either by evens or by fives or even by tens. Um, I have had uh, stage managers get annoyed when I started numbering things by tens and we got up to sound cue 400 and lights is in cue 12, you know, but that's uh, between you and the stage manager. Um, I try not to add cue identifiers until we get to paper tech. Now paper tech is when we sit down before tech, uh, preferably with stage manager, any designers who have cues, that's lights, sound, video, if there's scenic flying cues, um, anything like that, and the stage manager and hopefully the director. Um, that's when we go through moment by moment, just sitting down at the conference table or online and uh, identify, okay, start a show. We got pre-show music, pre-show music fades out with lights going house to half. That's lights cue what? That's light cue 15, great. And that's sound cue what? Sound cue two, great, awesome. And the stage manager writes it down. Hey, do we call the curtain speech after we get to house to half or do we wait a few seconds? Uh, let's wait a few seconds. Oh yeah, that sounds good. And so on, you have the conversation at Paper Tech work out all that stuff beforehand on paper before you have an entire team, an entire crew or entire cast sitting on the stage waiting for you to make your choices. This makes your tech mode flow much faster and much easier. Um, you'll still hit stumbling blocks and still have to, it'll still take an hour to get the first five minutes of the show. It always does. But at least uh, you can get the awkward um, whose cues on first out of the way first. 
Um, linking digital media cues to other areas can save your calls. Um, I like to link as much as possible, and that means saying, all right, this cue goes with lights up, this cue goes with lights is complete, this cue goes with the sound of the car horn, um, whatever it is, because I know that saves the stage manager time and it helps us stay on the same page so that I know my media that I'm generating connects to their element that they're generating. So if they're wanting to move it to a different line, fine, but I wanna make sure it's connected to that action, that sound, that movement, that light cue, um, and that can save the stage manager a whole lot of cue calling. Auto follows also can save calls and save time. Um, you just don't wanna to get too, uh, too in depth with that. I have done shows where I've hit go and I had sound cues and light cues all auto follow to give me a full 15 minutes of time to go to the bathroom. Um, so uh, that, that does lead to, to a precarious place should anything go wrong. Um, but uh, auto follows can help save some calls and some time, um, especially if you're linking. This map movement links to this root movement, links to this uh, heart pumping or whatever it is. Um, anything that you can take out of the stage managers, take off the stage managers uh, plate, makes them happy and honestly makes your show flow more consistently. Um, media, video, projection, these are three syllable words. Um, so um, one thing that was popular, uh, particularly back in the 80s and 90s, was um, the uh, digital media was uh, called tab because that was the playback device used on a computer to play back some of those things. They would hit the tab button to execute a video file. Um, and so a lot of stage managers started calling it tab. Tab 45 go, tab green go, tab double A go. Um, it's just easier to say, and it doesn't sound like sound. It doesn't sound like audio. It doesn't sound like lights. It doesn't sound like scenic. It doesn't sound like fly rail. Uh, and it's shorter. So you could get in the habit of calling your cues tab cues instead of media, video, or projection cues. But again, that's a preference of the stage manager. The system. Designing the system can be daunting, all right? There's a whole bunch of stuff that you wanna fit in there and you wanna make sure that it all works and it's okay. You don't have to be overwhelmed by it. Just start with the basic of what you've got and what you want it to do. If what you've got is a projector and a laptop, great, you're done. You've got your laptop to, to generate your media. If you wanna spit out a PowerPoint with that projection, hey, PowerPoint is sometimes the right answer. It is. Um, if that's what you have the time and skills and, and experience to, to work with, if you don't have $1,500 to spend on a watch out rig, if you don't have $800 to buy a seat of Isadora, then don't try to force yourself into the box of trying to learn a whole new program just because it's uh, prettier. All right. Sometimes the best solution is the easiest solution. Um, now in a system, it can contain any sorts of variables. If there's any kind of live cameras going on that are trying to send live feed, uh, if there's any kind of switchers or mixers, these are any devices that send audio or video from A to B, whether it's sending, for instance, this webcam image out to the internet so that you can see me. Um, so that's what switchers are. Switchers are basically just routing devices for video. Um, switches, which is routing devices for data, um, just like the network switches that we have that we plug our computer into that plugs into the router and the modem. Um, if we still have modems that aren't connected to routers, they are literally that. They're for routing the data, for sending data from point A to point B, whether you're sending it from a camera to a projector or sending it from a computer to uh, the internet or whatever it is. Switches, network switches are just another way of routing that signal. Power, you gotta make sure everything can turn on. So you don't want to, your, to, your presentation to depend on the life, lifetime of lasting of a battery of a laptop. Uh, so make sure that whatever kind of power supply you need, whatever kind of power support you need for the projector, for the playback software, for any kind of components of the system that you've got enough power to get it there. Adapters. Adapters are double-edged sword. Adapters, just like in audio world, for any of you who have played an audio world as well, adapters can be great and useful to get to give you a shortcut, but every time you use an adapter, it's gonna create noise. 
Uh, in sound, that means literal noise, and in video, that means visual noise. Uh, creates errors, data fallouts, and if you're using a digital transmission like HDMI or DVI, that means mm -hmm. it's just going to cut right off. Um, if any of you have experienced the lovely wonder of plugging in a lighting console, for instance, with a DVI port or a DVI plug, you have may maybe even noticed that, oh, if I plug in the monitor's DVI cord after I've started the computer, it's not going to recognize it because <laughs> it has to power up at the same time as the system. Um, so if it gets detached, for instance, ah, now i got to restart the system for that to come back on. Um, so any kind of adapters you're going to use, just be careful of what they're doing. Make sure that you, they're doing what you want them to do. Just because a thing can plug into a port doesn't mean it should. Okay. Um, amplifiers. Um, this includes both audio amplifiers to send their sound out to your passive speakers and your audience, but also video amplifiers. If you're trying to send video uh, long distance, uh, for instance, HDMI can only go 50 feet. That's it. That's why HDMI cables don't typically get manufactured longer than 50 feet because it just doesn't want to go further than that. Um, so if you need a video amplifier, you can get a video distribution amplifier that will push that video a step further um, if you need it. Um, patch bays are just like switches, switchers, and mixes, mixers. Um, it's just another way of getting signal from A to B. Sometimes this is in a video patch bay using B and C cables um, and special connectors. Sometimes it's an audio patch bay with uh, short jumpers of quarter inch and all those. Um, but Sometimes your system has a patch bay in it. If you're going to have some way of getting signal from A to B, break down your system to its bare components. Make sure that you know, all right, this device has these outputs. This device has these inputs. I need to make sure that A can connect to B and with as few adapters in between as possible. Um, if that means you've got a patch bay in between, then put a patch bay in between. If that means you need one adapter, then put one adapter. Um, but make sure that it'll work and test, test, test. Uh, obviously, whatever projector or surface you're going to use, if it's a TV, if it's a projector, projector, make sure that those are in the system and that you know that you're sending your signal there and that it'll get there. Um, uh, whatever playback control you're using, which is usually a computer these days, uh, but if you're using a slide projector carousel um, or if you're using um, uh, some other uh, method, uh, you're using a DVD player, then make sure that you have control over that. Um, and some way of monitoring, some way of seeing what you're, what you're supposed to be seeing. If you can't be physically in the space to see what the audience sees, you need some sort of monitor so you can see what you're supposed to be seeing and what's actually out there. Um, so you can easily troubleshoot, oh, hey, my screen says that I can see this, that, and the other, but on the projector, projection surface, I'm not seeing the top half of the screen. Why is that? Well, it's because there's that giant wall in the way. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we got to fix that. Um, so having monitoring can help um, to clarify those issues. Uh, when you're designing your system, um, it's just as simple as drawing squares on a piece of paper and connecting the dots. I've got a camera. I've got a projector. Connect the dots. Boom. Um, the ability to blend assets together, which is called compositing, um, can determine what your structure of your cues or content are, whether you're using QLab, Watchout, Isadora. These are all great programs to use. Um, all of them have free demos that you can use. QLab is only on Mac products. Uh, Watchout is only on Windows products. Isadora can work on both. Um, and they all have very lovely demos that you can play with, and there's plenty of tutorials online that you can watch of those. Um, these are not the only playback systems either. Um, but um, drawing your system diagram when you're des designing your system um, or your system schematic or your signal flow diagram uh, is used to just map out what is connecting to where. This can help you to make sure that you know where your signal is supposed to go and that you have the right cables, the right connectors, the right power sources, etc., to make that happen, to connect A to B to C. Um, if yes, you can draw it in AutoCAD or Vectorworks or Illustrator or Photoshop, you know, depending on InDesign, whatever works for you. But I have seen them drawn in Word. I've seen them drawn in PowerPoint. Um, uh, some folks prefer to draw it by hand. I can't tell you the number of post-its I've gone through because I changed at the last minute, changed my mind of how my system was going to lay out. 
and I threw it out on a piece of post-it like, oh, I need this to go to there and that to go to here. Getting it out of your head keeps that stress out of your head as well. Keeps that list out of your head. Make your list, make your drawing outside of your, uh, outside of your brain because keeping it all in your head at once is just gonna make you anxious <laughs> and cause problems because you'll forget steps. Um, I know a lot of folks like using flowcharts because it is literally about the flow of signal. So flowcharts like visual understanding environment view or OmniGraphle are, are popular as well. Here's one that's um, a system schematic for a reasonably complex system that I used a couple years ago that unified light, sound, and video into one playback. Um, so I had a QLab Mac that um, was triggering a, using a Motu MIDI fast lane, that's what, an adapter essentially, um, that's designed to convert the signal from the Mac to talk through MIDI to the ETC ION, the lighting console. And uh, that triggered the lighting system so that my cues in QLab could trigger lights, could trigger sound, could trigger video as well. Um, the QLab was also connected to a Motu sound card, just a firewire uh, USB um, external sound card that converts digital sound into, into analog sound to send out to actual speakers. And that was our, our conversion. And then I had some HD over IP senders um, because as I said, HDMI doesn't want to go longer than 50 feet. And in that case, it had to go longer than 50 feet. So we used uh, some Geffen HD over IP uh, adapters that you can send HD signal, um, which is high definition video signal. Depending on how it's, or, uh, how it's set up, you can send the, the audio signal as well um, over Cat5 cable, your regular ethernet cable. Um, we found those very useful. Um, uh, to send video from point A to point B for whenever we need it, that to happen. Um, because Cat5 um, Ethernet cable is cheap. You can make it and run as long as you want. Um, you can run up to probably a thousand feet depending on, on the video distribution. Um, and you're probably gonna be okay. So that is a relatively complex, but yours doesn't have to be complex. Yours could be camera, projector. The end, and I have done that. <laughs> I did a production of, of Christmas Carol that way. That was literally that short. So how do we get all this stuff? Well, hopefully you have some of it in stock, um, which can influence how you lay out your system, how you design your system. Um, if you've got some of the equipment, great, have an inventory, know what you need. If you wanna rent some stuff, you wanna say, hey, I wanna play around with Isadora, but I don't wanna shell out 800 bucks yet, then see if you can rent a system that has Isadora. Um, if you want to purchase equipment, hey, we're going to need this projector for all the shows this year, then maybe it's cheaper to purchase it than to rent it. Um, don't be afraid to build your own inventory. Projector placement. For placing your projector, it really depends on what your artistic intent is. What is your effect? What is your goal? Do you want actors to be in interacting with the image? Do you want them to not obscure the projection image? Because it is just throwing light on a surface. Um, do you want to see the shadows of the actors or of scenery and other elements? Um, should we see the projection on the performer or are we gonna wash it out with light so that we only see it on the wall? Um, how is lighting going to be used? Um, with lighting and projections, um, they're both forms of light and projections are significantly dimmer than our uh, theatrical lighting fixtures. So if we're going to uh, use light with it, we gotta know, all right, it's probably a good idea to do some side lights or some high sides. Um, we probably don't want front on because it'll wash out everything that's in the rear um, if your projection is coming from the front, that is. Um, so communicate with lighting about, okay, I want projector to go here to hit here. Can we avoid these angles of lighting on these surfaces and have that dialogue, have that communication? What are your specifications of your projectors required? How bright does it need to be? Um, we can get into, in, into fine details of, of, of brightness calculations, uh, but your brightness, your throw distance, your coverage really breaks down to where can your projector go? What does it need to hit? What, how much does it need to cover? And how bright does it need to be to be seen? And that's usually, it's almost never as bright as we want it to be. So we can always double it up, have a second projector doing the exact same thing. Or if it's a wider space, maybe we have two projectors and they blend in the middle so that we can have a larger image. Um, 
just like the inverse square law have a, has a, a lighting instrument, if you put in a wider barrel, it's the same amount of light covering a larger area, it's the same with a projector. The further away you get from your target, the larger the area that you're trying to cover, the less bright it is, and the less you'll see it. Um, Take note of any restrictions, obstructions, mounting locations. Uh, if you've got columns in the way, if you've got lighting instruments in the way, if you've got speakers in the way, I cannot tell you the number of times I've had uh, students uh, spec, oh yeah, I want my instruments here and here and here. And every time I sell them, <laughs> you got speakers there. You didn't put that in your plot. You should have noticed that because um, they're always there. Um, all these constraints can significantly affect where you're sticking your projector. Um, uh, and uh, affect how your content can be created. Uh, so don't wait, don't put it off. You wanna be able to plant your flag and say, all right, projector is going here. Everybody good, everybody good, great. Because then you can declare, hey, scenic, you said you weren't flying in those borders that low because projector has to hit that. Hey, lighting, you said you weren't flying your instruments in that low because that crosses the projection line. Providing that information as soon as possible and staking your claim can prevent problems and complications further on. Um, again, it's a negotiation. You don't get dibs, but whoever says it first does, typically. <laughs> so if you ask for something first, then great. Does it mean you might not have, might have to negotiate later? Like, eh, can we fly the projector out just a touch more? Yeah, okay, we can negotiate, we can do that. Uh, in the chat, we have seven minutes left. Thank you. All right, content creation. Now the, uh, yes, Ali, Ali has a question. Do, 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 do. What's your preferred method of doubling projectors? Using software mapping to overlap or position them to match with keystoning built into the projector? I um, will, I prefer to do a combination of both. Um, I, I, I prefer not to set the um, attributes of the projector too far off from their defaults. Just like with zeroing a soundboard every time you first get in the space, you should do the same thing with your projectors. Set everything to defaults because you don't know if the last person who used it shifted the lens to be all the way at the bottom. And then you've got these weird um, color striations and, and the blurriness around the edges because of just where it's hitting the lens. So always go back to your defaults um, and try to get them without changing the keystoning, without changing uh, the physical attributes of the projector as much as possible. Try and stick to the defaults as much as possible. Try to get them as close as you can. Then I prefer to, to do the rest of the mapping in software, um, in QLab, Watchout, Isadora, whatever I'm using, um, because I find that I can get a much more accurate image that way um, by adjusting what the what media is spitting out to the projector rather than what the projector is trying to hit. Um, so it's a combination of both. And sometimes you have to adjust them. You know, if you were trying to cover a full projection screen, well, you can adjust your content, but if your lens does not go that wide, then it's not gonna hit it. So yes, sometimes you need to play with your zoom and your, and your, um, uh, your keystoning and, and all of those things. For the process of content creation, initial phase is rough stuff, like literally hand-drawn napkins, that kind of stuff. Um, hopefully it should be in the correct uh, aspect ratio as your final content target, um, but this is low resolution type of stuff. Even if it's um, done, on, uh, done simply, this is just so you don't waste hours and hours and hours on building content that's not gonna be used. All right, it's good for rehearsals to, for them to see. It's like storyboards in, in, in movies. Um, and storyboards are one of those things that we use often. Firsts are a first revision that gives us a basic idea of the world. It may not be f perfectly fine-tuned imagery, but gives us pretty close. Um, and then, doo -doo -doo. Uh, intermediate phase are seconds if we have, depending on how much time we have, um, um, how much we can uh, dedicate to this. Uh, if we have time for that, seconds and then finals of, all right, this is what's going in the computer. This is what's going to go in the show. Um, so just as you can see from here, my first for this particular production started as literally drawing on the script and saying, hey, something about this. And the storyboards turned into, hey, how about something like this? and making sure that I had the right aspect ratio for what our screen surfaces was gonna be. 
then drawing first in Photoshop of, uh, it's gonna roughly look like this, and then layering on my layers to make it look a little more clean, and then actually running it through the projector with layers of, of masks and everything to make things subtle and blend and work together to support the performer and all that fun stuff, making sure that that's there. Reshoots and rebuilds are always on the table, um, but be wary. Um, you don't wanna fall into, the, into that trap if you can help it. Um, then you prep for tech week. Keep your paperwork up to date. That's what assistants are great for. Um, insist on a paper tech. Uh, make sure your all your crew has paperwork so that they know what to do. And if you get hit by a bus, that somebody can take over for you. Always have that backup information. Uh, plan for system failures. If such and such goes down, here's your backup. If this problem happens, here's what you do. If the operator hits go too early, here's what you can do. Do you pause? Do you stop? Do you reload? Have all those plans in place and test them. Rendering takes time, so if you can outsource that to a separate computer from what you're using for playback, that helps, um, because rendering can take hours and hours and hours. Um, and have placeholder images if you uh, need them in the meantime. If you're at tech and you, you don't have those last three images or you don't have your pre-show uh, thing ready, then yeah, put in placeholders so you know that, yes, there will be something there and that everybody knows that, oh yes, there will be something there. You don't have to light that wall. I'm gonna put something there just so you know. Then we load in, hang, focus, we align our projectors, um, stack them to increase brightness, which is literally putting them stacked on top of each other safely. Um, blend them if you need to blend them to create a larger surface or um, something like that. Warp and max, uh, warp and map to make your pixels line up, make it all fit, um, fit your target, fit your other projectors to line up to each other. Program, queuing, level set, a lot of this can be done in, in pre before you even get to the space, but um, it really changes once you get to actually start hearing the sound cues, seeing the light cues, seeing things move. Um, run the cues when you can, run it with cast. Uh, the tech table is helpful to have a laser pointer um, that, so you can say, hey, this area over here, we need to fix that. Oh, uh, did you mean this that we need to work on? That can help. Um, a highlighter app on the media server. The media server, you may hear that term, ooh, I need to get a media server now. No, it's okay. Media server, just any computer that you're using for playback. This is a media server, okay? My laptop is a media server. It's just a computer that's doing your visual playback. Um, it helps to have external monitors, secondary monitors. Uh, it helps to have fat, big, fast jump drives, um, desk lamp, water bottle, the usual tech table type stuff. Programming, ease of programming is crucial depending on what you know how to do. So if you aren't so great at QLab, but your assistant is, great. Tell your assistant what you want and they can do all the thinking uh, of that part for you and you can focus on the design aspect. All right, uh, projector focus often conflicts with lighting focus, so plan accordingly. If you need to coordinate so that, hey, can we do projector focus while you're lighting downstage? Great, then make sure that you're planning that accordingly. Um, and I will uh, pause there to see if there are any other questions before we run out of time. Do we have any other questions? There's a QA. and a uh, Preferred method of doubling projectors. Uh, oh, that's the one we already answered. Do, 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 do. Not getting many more minutes. Matt, I'd say how, how much more material did you have for us? Maybe some folks want to stick around a few minutes if you had the time. Uh, I, I have the time. I can, I can stick around a little bit more, um, but really I just want to answer any questions that come up, but we're, we're at tech, which is you know, usually when we Almost get to the there. Part, so, so yeah. um, Any questions for the chat? Um, if anyone wants to add that in now? If not, I'll just keep talking for a little bit and um, you can split and, and run off if you need to. Um, Keep everybody informed. Um, if you need a dark time to do notes, make sure that's known. Um, if you need a quiet time to do notes, make sure that's known. Um, make sure everybody knows who needs to fix what. If your assistant needs to fix the content while you're fixing the projector, while somebody else is fixing the connection, then make sure that everybody knows who needs to do what. Um, ask clarifying questions. Um, because often with digital media, whether it's projection or video screens, uh, TVs, Oftentimes we will have um, uh, 
it's, it can be difficult to understand what each person is going for. Um, so making sure that everything is clear before you put in hours and hours of work, uh, rebuilding content or rehanging the projector. Um, had a production where, hey, that projection is going up uh, too low. We, we can't, we, we have too much gap in the psych. But we already built all of the imagery to fit that, that rectangle. And that's, what do we do now? <laughs> it was okay. It was an easy fix. We literally just added a, a border. Done. Great. Awesome. <laughs> that fixed it. Everything's, everything's fine. So make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, having a professional photographer makes a difference, but always, always, always take your own shots just in case. I've had a number of shows where I had, oh, great professional photographer right next to me. But yeah, I'm taking my photos because I've, I've seen them. Like, Oops, they got hit by a bus or, well, not that, but they, for some reason, their photos don't make their way to me or that I don't get those because of copyright reasons or um, they're only used in the production brochures or something like that. Um, so always take your own photos to make sure you have them. Um, uh, if you're gonna do that, use a decent uh, digital single lens reflex camera with preferably 10,000 plus ISO. That's uh, just has, has how sensitive it is to light. Um, uh, take wide shots. You can always zoom in just so make sure that you see all the elements that you could need to see in your in your portfolio. Um, if you're using a uh, projection, make sure that uh, your recording camera uh, is at the same refresh rate as your projector or screen. So if you're doing video recording of your show, otherwise you'll see those bars. Remember the 90s and we saw all those CRT screens and you just see the bars passing over and over and over again. That's because the refresh rate of the screen didn't match that of the camera. Um, and being off axis, not centered, can help with that too. And then opening. After you've opened, um, have a conversation on where there should be no more changes when you go into show mode and nothing else is going to change. Usually this is opening night. Uh, I've had directors who have wanted to make changes the whole way through the run. That's always unpleasant. Um, but um, make sure you have that conversation to know when the work stops and it's saved and it's permanent and nope, that's the way it's going to be. Uh, secure all your gear, read and reply all to your show reports so everybody knows that you're, yep, uh, confirmed that that fixed that sound note, confirmed I fixed that video note, etc. Uh, archive in multiple formats and more, multiple locations um, and add it to your portfolio and or website immediately. You don't want to put it off because then you'll just forget about, oh right, I did that thing. Where did I put that? You want to put that in your website or portfolio as soon as possible. Um, oh yeah, no, then I had a, a case study, so we don't need to go into the case study. But are there any uh, questions before we split for the day? No, I, I don't think we've had any questions added to the Q&A or the chat. So I just want to, on behalf of the section, thank you for uh, joining us today. It was a, a very valuable presentation. We really appreciate your time. Absolutely. I'm going to uh, copy a link um, for you. Um, so if anybody uh, wants to uh, see this uh, later uh, if you want to reference this PowerPoint later I'm just going to send this to all panelists and attendees there's a Google uh, Drive uh, with a PDF of this PowerPoint so that you can reference back to it if you need to and if anybody uh, wants to contact me with more questions or thoughts you are welcome to do so <clears throat> and there's my email mcreynolds1 at ua.edu I guess that's it for your time. We really appreciate having you. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Take care.